Welcome everyone to this week's SQL query training uh, for the 70-461 exam. Uh, this week we're going to cover time functions, logical functions, and user-defined functions. Uh, I'm Steve Stedman. I'll be presenting the first two sections and Aaron Buma will be pre presenting the last section. For those joining us remotely, uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Google on-air broadcast. Uh, we'll address some questions, if they're appropriate, we'll address them as we go through the presentation. Some will have to wait till the end, uh, but we won't miss any of them. Uh, training is provided by emergency reporting, and if you want to download any of the slides or sample code, you can download those right now at my website, stevesedman.com. Uh, welcome viewers from all over the world. Uh, here's a list of people I could see who were uh, who had RSVP'd as attending, so uh, welcome everyone. And keep in mind with the Google on-air broadcast, there's about a 40 to 50 second delay usually from what we do live to what you actually see. Uh, we're still learning how to properly use the system, so be patient. And uh, if you miss anything or want to go back and play it again, uh, you can get it on my YouTube channel about an hour after the presentation ends at stevestedman.com slash YouTube. If you have any questions along the way, uh, there's this little three by three grid icon that's shown in the middle of the screen here. Uh, that you can click that and you get questions that show up on the right side of the screen in the in the live broadcast. Uh, and any questions you ask there, we'll try and get those addressed appropriately. Also, keep in mind when you ask that question, it's we're seeing it about 40 to 50 seconds later than what you're seeing live. So uh, sometimes we might have to back up a little bit or follow up at the end to get that question addressed. Agenda, as I mentioned, date and time functions, logical functions, and user-defined functions. Let's jump into it with the date time functions. So the date time functions that we're going to cover will be the get date, uh, date part, which lets you break out specific parts of a date to use it if you needed it uh, to use it programmatically somewhere. Uh, date add, which is really handy. It's always tough to figure out how to do date addition yourself because there's lots of weird situations that come up there. Uh, date diff, which is an easy way to calculate differences between dates. Uh, and then the blank from parts, and this would be date or date time or date time two or small date, different things like that from parts where you can pass in a number of parameters. Uh, and then that one I've tagged as 2012, meaning that's a new one that was introduced in SQL Server 2012. Well, newer, uh, I guess we are in 2015, so it's not really that new anymore. Uh, but for those who are still using 2008 or 2008 R2, that one's not available for you yet. And EO, EO month, which gives you a way to easily get at the end of the month calculate the last day of the month. All right, so get date's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's a function you call, and it returns the current database system timestamp as a date time value without the database time zone offset. So uh, let's take a look at this now. We'll jump into some sample code. Uh, we'll do our normal query training database. Drop that and start fresh. Uh, and then we're just gonna use the get date function. And when you call get date, you're getting back uh, in whatever the local uh, collation is set. So if you had your collation set, and I should have set the, the demo of this, but it's set to something where it's a different date format. This is formatted off the US date format. So 2015, actually it's not quite off the US date format, but it's uh, uh, 2014, March 19th at 9.03 AM and 51.390 seconds. Uh, if we just want to get the time part out of that, we can use convert to time on get date, and that will allow us just to extract out the time part of it. There's not a there's not really just a get time that will give us the current time. We just use the get date function, and uh, using convert, or you could use cast there as well. Uh, there's some other options you can use to get get dates and times out of the system. Uh, we've got the get date function we talked about. Get sys date time, sys UTC date time, current timestamp, and get UTC date. Now, what I'm gonna do is run all of these together and cast them as a time, or convert them to time. When we do that, we can see the first one here, we call get date, it comes across as 9.05, because that's what time it is here as we're doing the demo. Uh, sys date time is 9.05, so we haven't specified for our current system any type of an offset, so the the time of the server is in the same time zone that we're in right now, so they match, so they match up. The UTC date time, which is uh, basically seven hour offset for us because we're in, uh, we in or out of daylight savings time right now, I forget which one it is, but we're uh, 
It's seven or eight hours for us, depending on whether we're in daylight saving yeah. time or not. So uh, UTC time is 1600. And the current timestamp uh, is just 905. So that matches over here. And the UTC date is uh, showing 1605. So you can see based off of these, uh, if you're doing world calculations, sometimes you need to calculate the time zone in Spain or in Africa or something like that. Not the time zone, but the current time in, in that place. And it might make more sense to pull the UTC date time out of the system based off your database rather than whatever the current time is where your database resides. Next, we'll take a look at the date part function. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just a function you call, and you give it a parameter up front, and we'll look at all the different parameters that are there, and you pass in a date. And you can use uh, a date set as a variable, but in this case, I'm going to be using just the get date function so we can look at the current one. Uh, but what you're passing in could be a time, a date, a small date time, a date time, a date time two, or a date time offset. So pretty much any of the date or time objects in SQL Server could be passed in. And the way it works, here I've broken it out in a number of functions. Uh, I'm just going to highlight the first part here and run get date part of year for the current for get date, which is right now. When we run that, we can see it takes the date that's given and it extracts the year from it and it gives us 2015. Uh, I know I've written functions in the past in several different languages where you need to take pieces of a date and break them up for some kind of recurring in interval or figuring out how do we take something that's today and schedule it two weeks out, different things like that. And it's always messy. This, this really cleans up what you can do there. So the options we've got here are, let's take a look at the, oops, take a look at the list. Uh, we've got year, which gives us what we want there. Quarter, month, day of year, day, week, weekday. Now, the weekday will give you like the Monday through Friday or sorry, uh, Sunday through Saturday, uh, day of the week, uh, as an integer. And that's the thing, the return value from all of these is, is an integer. Uh, you'll get the hour, minute, second, millisecond, microsecond, nanosecond, and ISO week. So let's take a look. We'll try running this and see what we get. As our results now, the year is 2015. It's the first quarter of the year, it's the third month, it's the 78th day of the year right now, it's the 19th of the month, it's the 12th week, it's the fifth weekday. So today's Thursday, Wednesday would have been the fourth, Tuesday would have been the third, Monday would have been the second, and Sunday would have been the first. So it's one through seven for the days of the week from Sunday through Saturday. Keeping in mind different systems that you might look at may calculate those different, like some of them treat Sunday as a zero and Saturday as a six, but this is uh, one through seven. We've got the hour, minute, and second of our time here. And then there's a couple other ones here that uh, they're just, we'll show them, but the microsecond and the nanosecond, uh, not exactly very precise, but uh, we're looking at the current time is 9.08 and 7.547 milliseconds. But t stretching that out to nanoseconds and microseconds, I think it would be a little bit more, uh, we have more detail there if we're passing in a date time too instead of a date time parameter. And then the ISO week, so it's in the 12th ISO week of the year. And the ISO week matches what SQL Server has for the week set up here. So we're in the 12th week at this point of the, of the year. So, this is one of those, it's uh, you're probably not gonna use it every day, but it's a handy one when you need to extract part of a date out. And it really doesn't matter what your collation is set to or what the local date time format is. If you're asking for the day or the hour or the week, you're gonna get it back from that date time uh, or date or any of those different objects there. Yep. It doesn't collate based on locale then? Like what if you're using a different calendar, year, China, or it's going to give it, I mean, if you're asking for the year, it's going to give you the year back based off of whatever your server settings are. Okay. I don't know, and that's that's a really interesting question because I don't know if there's a SQL server option that uses like a different right. count, like that it's not 2015 somewhere or the Mayan calendar or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
I guess that ended in 2012. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but as far as the quarter, I mean, it depends on your, your collation. I mean, it, it, it might say that quarters are structured differently, but it will give you, if you ask for the quarter, no matter what format you're, you're, you're passing in or where you're at, it'll give you back whatever the current quarter is. Uh, the next one we've got is date add. And I love this one. And the reason I love it is because doing math on dates is always difficult. I don't know if you guys have ever done that for uh, like in code or whatever, but it's, it's a mess and it's ugly because you've got uh, the, it'd be nice if all the months were the exact same length and there were no leap years and stuff like that. But you've got some months that are 30 days, some months that are 31 days, some months that are 28 days, some months that are 29 days. Uh, you've got leap seconds. I mean, not that that happens very often, but you've got to account for all that. Uh, Cody's laughing. I think you did a presentation on this yeah. a while ago on how difficult that really is to do. Uh, and yeah, it's really darn difficult to do date math. So what this does is this gives you, this does all the heavy lifting or the hard work for you. So uh, you just use the date add function. You pass in what you're adding. And in this case, we're adding one month to the current date. We could add uh, two months or 10 months or one year or whatever it may be, uh, but similar to what we had before. So with all of the different types here, you can use similar types in the date add function. So let's take a look here. Uh, select date add month to get date. So right now it is May 9th, or sorry, March 19th. And if we add one month to that, it should give us April 19th. And you can see there our result shows April 19th. But what happens if we want to subtract, do a date subtract? Can we just call date subtract instead of date add? Well, not really. There's no function for that. So what we do is we just give it a date add with a minus date or a minus offset. And you can see now it takes us back to February 19th. All right. So now let's take a look at some different ways of doing this. Uh, but I guess I didn't have all the examples there. But if we took uh, quarter... and bring down date add quarter uh, one to get date based off our current date. We are on March 19th, which is the first quarter. That should jump us to about June 19th. So we do the math and there we go. It shows up as June 19th. Independent of how many days were, I mean, I know uh, April, May, and June have the same number of days every year, but if this had been jumping over a leap year with February or something like that, it would do the math appropriately and get us out to the right date. So if we went from, uh, let's say, January 19th on a leap year versus a non-leap year, if we're date adding a quarter, it's going to be April, one forward is going to be April 19th from January, January 19th, independent of whether we're in a leap year or not. So what's it do when you add a month to January 30th? That's that's a really good question. So let's give it. Let's give that one a try. So let's change this to month. And oops, twenty fifteen one thirty. So what it did at that case is it took the thirtieth of January and it added a month out. And based on whatever rules they have in there, they determined it wouldn't make sense to skip February entirely and push you into like the beginning of March. But let's see if we do uh, 129, I assume we'll also put us at the same point, February 28th. Or if we go 128, it puts us to February 28th at that point. So if you did 2016 or whatever the leap year is, right? 2016. So adding a month next year, because it's leap year, will put us on February 29th. So it, it accounts for all of that so that we don't have to deal with it there. But if you do 228 of this year and you add a month, it's not going to give you the end of the month for, for March. It's just going to give you March 28th, right? Right. So, so, so the example was if it's February 28th, and if you're taking February 28th, and we can do that right here, 228th, it's not going to adjust it back to the last day of the month. It's going to go to March 28th. So and if you've got a car payment or a house payment or something that's a recurring monthly payment set up and you happen to get paid on the 30th of the month every month, well, 
I don't know when you get paid in February. Maybe you don't get paid in February in that case. But if you get paid on the 30th of the month every month and you've got this recurring payment and date add is being used to say, all right, we collected the payment on January 30th. We're going to add a, a month to it. It's going to adjust it to February 28th or 29th, depending on the year. And then after that, it's going to continue on the 28th of the month, not on the 30th of the month. For anyone who does auto pay on their online banking, it might be fun to go in and play around with that and see if they're doing uh, what they're doing with date calculations. However, it could be dangerous. You could end up uh, missing a payment on something if they're not doing their math correctly. So next on to take a look at date diff. So date diff and date add are kind of the opposite there. So what date diff does is it takes two dates in time and it gives you the difference between those in different uh, in the different components. So if we said uh, get date between now and something in 1492, that would give us the calculation of the number of years if we passed in year, or we could get it in quarters or months. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the sample code on date diff on how that works. So we'll start out here. We'll just say give me a date diff in weeks from January 1st of this year to the current date. And when we looked at the date part earlier on weeks, we got 12. And when we run this, we get 11. And the reason for that is that, we, are, however, we are in the 12th week of the year. January 1st of this year was in the first week. And the difference from between 12 and 1 is 11 at that point. Now, what if we uh, had, a, the, had our order backwards? Does the order matter there? Well, if we run it with uh, give me the number of weeks between the current date and January 1st, well, in that case, it's going to go negative and show that that January 1st was negative 11 months uh, from today, or it was 11 months ago. So let's take a look now. What I've done is I've taken January 1st versus the current date, and I've passed in a bunch, all, all the different parameters here that are available. And when we run this, we can get our results back and see that for year and quarter, well, January 1st is in the same year and the same quarter that today is, so those show up as zero. For month, we're getting uh, two months apart, days, day of year and day. Uh, we're getting the same number there, and then you can see the calculations all the way down. Uh, but where it gets interesting as we scroll to the bottom here, you notice there was no result on these last two. And the last two that were shown were to calculate microsecond and millisecond. And if we look at our messages window, you'll notice we got some errors showing up here that state it resulted in overflow. Well, the function returns an integer. And the number of milliseconds or microseconds from January 1st until now of this year is more than you can fit in an integer. So we get overflow here. So that's just something you want to keep in mind. And you can't, I mean, the function does always return an integer at that point. So if you get overflow, I don't really know a way around it other than let's just uh, do a smaller range. So if we take millisecond and microsecond and calculate between today and with no date, it assumes midnight. So between midnight today and now, and we run it, well, we still get an error, but we, we got the number of milliseconds from midnight until now, but microseconds still breaks. So we're going to try between now and 11 a.m., which is roughly about an hour and 40 minutes or so from here. And that still gives us uh, too much big of a number. So if we try between 10 a.m., too large, we go between... Uh, it is 9.19, so we'll go between like 9.15. You can see that it is uh, several million, 286 million microseconds from 9.15. Now, not every day are you in a situation where you have to be calculating milliseconds or microseconds, but I just wanted to show how the overflow works there. Uh, but really what, it, what you're going to, this is really handy when you're trying to figure out uh, intervals uh, between any two given dates uh, and it does all the math for you and again things like we talked about with leap years or whatnot it takes those into account appropriately questions so, sorry uh, so if you're querying on a um, date field 
Um, should should you always use date dip in your word clause, or would it? Could you just use a equals or less than or greater than? Is you know? Is there any? I mean, okay. Is, so that's a great question. Uh, if you're querying, you're trying to figure out a difference between dates. For instance, should you use the date diff in your where clause in a select statement? Right. Okay. So it depends, and that, that's that's always the answer. But let me explain why it depends. If you're on uh, doing the date diff on a fixed date, yeah, that's that's okay. Like if you're saying, give me the date diff between these two dates for some reason, and it's two fixed parameters you're passing in. Yeah, it's going to happen. That's going to effectively be calculated once because those aren't changing. But if you're in a table, let's say it's got a million rows in it, or even a thousand rows, and you do date diff between a column in the table and another date, or even between two columns in a table, what that's going to have to do before it can use it in the where clause, because keep in mind the where clause is intending to filter that stuff out, mm -hmm. but before it can filter it out, it has to scan every single row in that entire table do that calculation on every single row and then throw it out and that can be extremely inefficient right. so like i said it, it depends there's different scenarios and there's some scenarios where maybe you can't get around that but if there's a way to say like if you're trying to figure out all of the rows in a table where a given date is is less than 30 days from today i would rather use date add off of today with a minus 30 and then say where that column is greater than that calculation mm -hmm. rather than doing this and, and you need to look at it, it it's doing a calculation once versus n where n is the number of rows in the table does that answer what you're yeah, looking for there good. okay is there, so, any, is there any value in microseconds seems like there was no additional precision so it's really just milliseconds times a thousand and uh, when you're using so the question is is there any value in microseconds or even milliseconds. It's a, well, no, milliseconds, milliseconds is, is clear there. Change, but, but, right? but with microseconds, uh, because we're, we use get date, which returns a date time object, no, there's no value difference there than uh, in microseconds and milliseconds. But if you're passing in a date time two object, which I should have done a demo to show that, uh, date time two can have greater precision than date time does. And it does include microseconds. So if you're doing an extremely precise calculation between this date time two and that date time two object, yes, microseconds would make sense. But not with get date, uh, you just don't have that precision. So good good point there. So next, uh, this is a chunk of code that I've been asked about several times when we're trying to do uh, different reporting and things. But uh, it's from my blog and it shows an example of using date add and date parts to do rounding and truncation of dates. And uh, if you're trying this before noon, uncomment the following line to simulate an afternoon time because things show up a little bit different in the afternoon on how this is calculating. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to declare this date time variable. I'm going to do a get date. I'm going to add 12 to it. And then I'm going to do some calculations on it. So if I just run this, and what I'm going to do is say date add, uh, and I'm going to round it to the second. Now, you might think, well, rounding to the second, I mean, there's nothing built in automatically that will round things to the second for you. So if you you can use uh, different ways to truncate it or whatnot, but uh, what I'm going to do, because I've got truncate into the second and rounding the second, when I run both of those, you can see, let me zoom in on this, that the first one is 10 seconds after the minute and the second, well, of course, they're both at the same time here, but, and they go to rounded to the second and truncated to the minute. Oh, so what, what we're doing here is it's rounding. The 363 gets rounded down to uh, the second. And actually, I should have not run both of those. We just run the first one here. So let's run that again. And now you can see in this example, because it's 857 milliseconds, that rounds up. And there was no rounding built in on SQL Server, but it's a common thing. I mean, no rounding built in on date times like this. So what we have to do is take the date, we're going to add milliseconds, and we're going to add 500 minus, and then we're going to uh, take the date part of the date variable plus a half of a second. So we're taking the date variable we're adding a half a second to it then we're subtracting a second a half second off of it and effectively what we get out of that is rounding it to the second 
Truncating is easier than rounding because it's just chopping things off. So here, what we're doing is we're taking, and we're gonna date add a minute, and we're going to do a date difference in minutes between the current time, or between zero and the date variable. So in that case, if it's, well, what it's doing is it's taking the date, doing the calculation and calculating it out exactly to the minute. So we'll run that and you can see the second one down here took the 26 minutes and three seconds and rounded or truncated off to 26 minutes. And you can see we can do round into the minute where we have to do a date add calculation. We can truncate to the hour or round to the hour, truncate to the day or round to the day. And really what we're doing in each one of these is we're taking the date part we're pulling a chunk out of it and we're doing math to calculate it out so we can do the rounding appropriately there. And if we highlight all of these and run through them, oops, too far. When we look at the results, you can see here the original rounding to the day chops off all the time. And, and again, we could have just cast that to a date. Uh, uh, sorry, the truncated to a day, we could have cast to a date, but rounding to a day, we couldn't do it that way. Uh, rounded to the hour, rounded to the minute. So there's just an example of using the functions that we've just covered uh, to do something useful there uh, as it comes up. Yeah. All right. On to one of the SQL Server 2012 added functions is date from parts. And uh, I just want to flip through a couple slides here because we have date from parts, we have time from parts, Date time from parts, date time two from parts, and small date time from parts, date time offset from parts. So all those slides we're kind of looking at similar things. So really, what what each of these do, does is it takes it allows you to take the independent chunks that make up a date, year, month, and day, for instance, and or year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds, if it's a date time, and turn that into a date object. And this is one of those that. Independent of the collation, this is always going to work correctly based off of this order. So if you have uh, a string in SQL Server and you just put in 2015-03-19, yeah, you'll get it to work for certain collations. It will show up and give you the appropriate date based off of that. But based off of different uh, locales, different collation settings for different parts of the world, that may or may not work correctly. So using the date from parts functions, it will return a date given the year, month, and day in independent of the collation. So you're safe here. You can always put it in in that order, and you always get the date back. Uh, date time from parts, similar thing. You don't have to figure out what's the appropriate order to format everything. Are we in... Uh, on whatever the location is, you just pass in the parameters always in this order and you always get back a time. Uh, date time, you can kind of see a trend here, right? Date time from parts, more parameters you get back, date time given that order. And date time too, it just has more precision than date time, but it also takes up less space in certain scenarios where you're not using that precision. So similar thing there, and a small date time from parts, year, month, same idea, you guys get it. Uh, and date time offset, very similar too. So kind of zipping through some of that there, but let's just take a look at some sample code. So the old way that you would have to do this prior to these functions, uh, and I'm going to throw a carriage return in here just to make it all fit better. But if you wanted to get a date, you'd have to take your date time object or whatever, wh whatever you're passed in, let's say it's a, and, and convert it, pull out 2012, pull out June, pull out the day, pull out the month, pull out the day. But then as I say it, I realize, well, maybe it's not the month and day. That really depends on what collation we're in or what order we're, we're working with here. So when we do this, let's take a look at what we get when we run it. We get, Ju we get June 1st. But we could have got January 6th, depending on a different collation. But here, year, month, day, when you use date from parts, it doesn't matter uh, what collation you're in, you're always going to get back, in this case, November 10th. And based off of the parameters that are being passed in there. Now, do we need the four-digit year on this? 
it's one of those things that comes up. Uh, we're kind of lazy usually, and sometimes we don't always put in the 20 in front of the 2015 or 2012 or whatever it is. Well, you don't need you, you don't need the leading unless you want to do it in this millennium. Uh, if you pass in 12 for the year, it takes it literally as the year 12. Can you do negative? Let's give that a try. Let's see what happens. Uh, no, it doesn't like BC or negative dates at that point currently. <laughs> All right, so let me pull that out of there. But if you were recording BC dates for like a timeline, you would need to have a separate field to designate. And it, it might be, well, let's try that when we do the date time two. I don't know if date time two supports that or not. That's a really interesting question. That's what I love about doing some of these trainings. We get questions we've never thought of before. So uh, then we've got time from parts. You guys get it, kind of a similar thing. We're going to pass in 11.15 a.m. and 20 seconds with a fraction of uh, 100 or 100, 1.47 milliseconds with three digits of precision. There you go. We get it back as what you might have expected there, 11, 15, and 20 seconds. Date time from parts, similar thing, you'd, what you'd expect there. Date time two from parts, okay, here's where we're gonna try messing around with it in a moment for negatives. But here we are, we're in, we get back to date time two with the precision there. Let's just say we're gonna try and do the negative of year 12, so 12 BC and see what we get. Oh no, it doesn't take negatives on the year. But good question. Uh, I will, when, afterwards I'll follow up and see if there's a way to represent negative or BC dates in SQL Server. Uh, all right, BCE, is that the proper way to say it? Okay, uh, so then we got, <clears throat> we'll, th so here's an interesting one where we're gonna get another error here. When we run this, we get some of the arguments have values which aren't valid. Well, the reason is because we're passing in 147 milliseconds with one digit of precision. Now that one digit of precision is going to take up less space when it's stored, but you can't put a 147 into it. So if we make that a little bit smaller and give it one millisecond, okay, yeah, that works. But it's not really one millisecond at that point. It's one tenth of a second or decisecond if there was such a thing. Uh, and But if we want to go back to the 147 as number of milliseconds, we have to have at least three digits of precision here. Small date time, just a smaller way of storing dates and times, a little bit more efficient. Uh, we run that, we get down to, this is where it gets interesting because we passed in 2012, 1110 at 1115. We don't have any second accuracy on the small date time at this point. So if you're doing work where you're concerned about the size of your dates and times you're storing, but you're not so concerned about down to the second accuracy, you can use the small date time for that. And then we've got the date time offset from parts. And what's different about this is we give it an hour offset, a minute offset that weren't there earlier. So this is like eight hours, so like GMT plus eight. And you can see when we run that, although we gave it 11.15 as our time, it shows 11.15, but it shows the plus 08 at the end of it there. And if you were gonna do like GMT minus eight as our time, we could put a negative in there and run it and that's, our time offset. Oops. All right, on to the end of the month. As we already talked about with February, end of the month can be challenging to figure out. Uh, given today, what's the last day of the month if I want to do some kind of, I don't know, account reconciliation or billing or something like that on the last day of the month. It varies every single month. So what you do is you give, use EO month and you pass in a date or you can add months to it. You can say, give me the end of the month for January plus three, which would be really asking for the end of month for April. So let's take a look at how that works. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna declare this date time uh, and put in 2012, 11, 10, so November 10th, and I'm gonna ask for the end of date for November. Sorry, end of month for November, which gives us November 30th. Then I'm going to do the same calculation, but I'm gonna give it end of month with plus one month in the future. The first one gets us November 30th, and the next one gives us December 31st, because there's 31 days in December. And now if we want to go, let's, instead of minus one, it's going to do the, go back to October. But let's do plus three, in my math correctly. 
that will put us into February and calculate 228, and that will keep in account leap year calculations there as well appropriately. We've already done the demo on all of these. Uh, so just a note, uh, if anybody wants to connect with us on LinkedIn, uh, here's our LinkedIn profiles. Uh, if you want more information, we, we push out the trainings here. Uh, LinkedIn, Steve Stedman, or LinkedIn, Aaron Buma. Now on to logical functions. So is date time two kind of an adjustable thing like a money or decimal type? Kind of like that. I'm going to hand this one to Aaron because you looked in you. I think I know the answer, but you you looked flexible. at that through. Like a like decimal types, you can say I want twelve digits and three decimal places, right? Yeah. And then you or you or you can give up the twelve total, but you want six decimal places, so, which only gives you six on the characteristic. Well, uh, date time two has more precision, and it also uh, takes up less data storage. In date time if you're not using all the precision yeah if you don't use all the precision if you're using the exact same precision as the regular date time field it takes up less storage space but it's probably not an integer right like the others no no like the others are like milliseconds since 1753 or something right or yeah. or, or depending on which type right right well if you're looking at like a unix timestamp that's since 1970 i think and there's I mean, but the date time object in SQL Server is much more as is much more flexible than milliseconds since 1970, like the Unix timestamp is. So it takes up more than an integer, but the date time too will allow you to take up a little bit less space. So, right, on to logical functions. So the logical functions we're going to cover here are the case statement, the IIF or IIF function. Uh, the choose and the coalesce, and I don't know why coalesce is showing up as a larger font there. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, uh, the, however, there were a couple others in the chapter that were talked about that we're not going to cover because they were covered earlier. One of them, I think, was the is null, and I think we've uh, beaten that one to death in, in the trainings we've been through, so we'll skip that one. Uh, so case. Case is really interesting. It's one of those that, no, it seems to me like no matter how long I've been using SQL Server, uh, whenever I want to use a case statement, because I don't use them often enough, I've got to just go look up the syntax. It's not one of those that just easily just I type out when I'm working there. So go check the syntax. But what it does, it's like a case statement in any other language. Uh, it evaluates a list of conditions and returns one result. So uh, in this one, and, and there's really two different ways of formatting the case. And in this one, uh, this is more like an if statement, actually, uh, where we're saying case when revenue is greater than average revenue, then do this, else, do that, and end. So it's a, in this case, it really is an if statement that's being run as a case. Uh, but And there's two different ways you can format it. One is what's just the when and then and an else. Or in this case, it's more like a real case statement where we're saying when, uh, and this would be looking at uh, polygons, where if we're looking at a polygon with one Point, one corner effectively, and maybe corner is not the right thing when we're talking about points, but uh, one is a point, two creates a line, three gives us a triangle, four gives us a square, and so on. Uh, otherwise, anything beyond that, we, we throw back the else of null. And so if the variable corners, so case of corners, let me jump back to the previous one. Uh, in the previous, oops, previous slide, we had case blank when an expression. And in this one, we have case of something when it's a solid, when it's an actual value. So two different ways you can do it. You can leave the case empty and uh, put in a comparison on each one of those or expression, or you can just pass in a variable that gets checked on each line going through. So let's take a look at using So I'm going to drop the database and recreate it, and I'm going to put a table in the database called revenue. And in here, this will have revenue numbers, uh, where the first quarter or first column is a department, the second column is an amount of a revenue, and the third column is a year. So we have department one, two, and three for years 1999 through 2012. So uh, we'll use that in just a moment, but let's take a look first at the case statement we saw on the slide with the point. So. When, when we run this, we're going to uh, 
declare a variable called corners. We're going to set it to six and run this select statement. And I would expect that if it works correctly, we'll get back a hexagon, which is a six-sided object. Run that, we get back hexagon. Uh, three, get back triangle. I mean, not super useful. I mean, most of us can figure that out. But uh, all, actually, all of us can figure that out. <laughs> but uh, it just it's a good way to show here's how the case statement works. Yeah, sometimes when you're in front of the camera, you put your foot in your mouth. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, but let's take a look at another example here. So what we're going to do is assume that we wanted to display an indicator to see which departments were above the average revenue. So let's select out here, uh, and we're just going to do the windowing function, average revenue, partitioning by department ID, which you guys remember from one of the earlier trainings. And for department one, it shows the average revenue of 35355 For department two, it shows the average revenue of 41400 for department three, 56,000. So basic windowing function. But how would you go about saying, is this revenue column here greater than or less than the average revenue that's calculated out in this other column? Well, the way we can do that is with a case statement. But I don't want to put the, the aggregate function with the windowing inside of our case statement. So what I did is I initially wrapped the query inside of a drive table or a subquery. So if we just run the inner part, we get the same results back. And that windowing function is being put into a column called average revenue, or alias is average revenue. And then we're going to say when the revenue case, when the revenue is greater than the average revenue, then our result will be a string called better than average. Else, it'll be a string called not better. And that'll go into a column called ranking. When we run the results there, we now get out in the side here, not better or better than average. Now, you'll notice the way I phrased that was better or not better. I didn't phrase it as better or worse. Now, not better includes the case where it's equal. So if you wanted to go in and do a calculation that said, is it equal to the average? Is it greater than the average? Or is it less than the average? You'd have to use a uh, case when and put in multiple whens and thens to get that calculated out. So that's the quick and dirty overview of the case statement. Now, like I said earlier, the case statement is one of those that probably no matter how often you use it, you're never going to use it often enough to just be able to code it, directly code it, maybe after this training you will, but directly code it without looking up the syntax. Uh, one of the things with that one of the things that Microsoft has done to help simplify that is the IIF function. And what it does is it's like an if statement that's going in line, and it's like a Boolean version of the case statement. So it returns one of two values depending on whether the Boolean expression is true or false. Okay, if you've ever seen IIF in Excel or VB or other Microsoft languages, uh, it's it's very similar. So the first parameter is a Boolean expression. Here it's revenue and average revenue. And the second parameter is the result that is displayed if it's true. The, the third parameter is the result that's displayed if it's false. And one of the questions that always comes up is what does IAF stand for? Is it immediate if, inline if, if, if and only if? Good one. Uh, I, Go check the Microsoft documentation. I've been asked this. I've probably Googled on it 15 times uh, since I first did a presentation on this. Uh, they don't say. It's just the IIF, IIF function. You can call it IF or inline if or immediate if or whatever, but it, Microsoft doesn't say anywhere what it really means from what I can tell. Uh, so some details on this are uh, it's the performance is very similar between IIF and CASE, if not exactly the same as if you did a single uh, case statement uh, with two options like that. Uh, it simplifies the code, and I think it leads to cleaner code. However, on the alternative to clean code, you can nest it up to 10 levels deep. Uh, well, I would argue that if you're really going to nest the inline or the IIF function 10 levels deep, maybe you shouldn't be using that function. Maybe you should be using a case statement or something else, or uh, anyway, something else in that case. But 
And then another interesting thing about it, the true and the false values, or parameter two and parameter three, cannot both be null. But think about that. I mean, if I'm saying if some Boolean variable, then null, otherwise null, why say if? Because either way, it's going to be null. Why not just put the word null in there and forget IIF at that point, and you've got the right answer. So uh, let's take a look at using it at this point. So I, I like it a lot, and it's one of those ways to just really simplify things. So we'll use the query training database. Similar query to what we looked at before, but instead of a uh, case statement, I'm going to put in a single line here called IIF, and I'm going to say evaluate revenue greater than average revenue. If it's true, display better. If it's false, display not better. And overall, let's see, run that. We get the same results we did before. Scroll back up to the case up here. And I would argue at this point that the IIF is cleaner code than using the case statement if you're on SQL Server 2012 or newer. Uh, and I've almost been tempted working on older versions of SQL Server to go and code my own version of IIF to just have it as a function that we could use that would make it backward compatible, but I just haven't got around to doing that. So you can you don't have to use it in uh, a query with tables. You can put fixed or uh, static values in here or hard coded values. So if three equals two, then return true. Otherwise, return null. Let's see what that does. How often does three equal two? Well, in math as I learned it, uh, three three never equals two. Uh, and so true would never be returned in this case. So what it's doing when we run it is it's returning, oops, wrong button. It's returning null. Now here's an example. If one equals seven, which we know will never happen, is it gonna return null or is it gonna return null? <laughs> here's the interesting message. At least one of the result expressions in a case statement or in a case specification must be an expression other than null. Do you guys think that IAF is just simply a wrapper around case, the case statement that Microsoft put together? Perhaps. Either way, it does simplify things a little bit. Uh, another way to simplify function, simplify the case statement is the choose. So the choose function, again, this one was introduced in SQL Server 2012. Uh, it's a function that returns an item at a specific index. So you give it choose, you give it an index, it's just gonna be an integer and a number of values, a number of parameters, a number of things that are being passed into there, and it gives you back the one that's at that position. Uh, if the index is greater than the number of values or less than one, it returns null. So if you say, give me the choose of zero of whatever your list is, you're gonna get null back. And it's easier than case in some examples. Uh, so let's take a look at an example here. So we originally had the case statement as shown below here with our corners and points where when it's one, two, three, four, five, six through eight, it gave back this result. Here, instead, we could use the choose function where the first parameter is the corners or the thing that we're evaluating against the offset, and it's gonna return point, line, triangle, square, et cetera, through the list there. So it's smaller code. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the choose statement, it's uh, a little bit cleaner, I think. It's just a little bit tighter uh, and makes your overall coding a lot easier. Uh, in my experience, when you're working with case statements and the way that SQL gets reformatted in queries, they always get in a position where they're extremely hard to read. Case statement, or the choose statement, I think is a little bit cleaner at that point than the case. So let's take a look at that exact code and see what happens here. The old way, select case, uh, or if we just run that, you can see we get hexagon back like we did before, or using choose, I should have uppercased that, uh, we're going to pass in the corners, and we can get it, oops, and we get back the sixth item. In that case, it's hexagon. Yeah. Now, choose the day of the week example. So uh, the day is four. When we run that, we get back Wednesday. Now, if I had, that doesn't match up with the day of the week that uh, we had from uh, the previous example, but we could have indexed these. There's no index here. Uh, we could have done like day minus day plus one or something to be able to get it to appropriately calculate based off of the Thursday being the fourth day of the week in the previous example that we saw. Now, how about pick five people from a random list of 10? 
Okay, so all those in the room know why I would pick uh, five people out of a random list of 10 uh, every morning. Uh, so in this example, we're gonna run this. Uh, I'm gonna use the go statement, or the go five, which says do this five times. I'm gonna calculate uh, a random number, and I'm going to choose from this list of all these names. All right, interesting. Well, as we run this, Aaron, Darren, Aaron, Bill, and Steve. So Aaron got called on more times than usual, which is about right after what we've seen. But if you look at it, you can see, okay, there's Aaron, there's Aaron, and actually, there he is again, just to sort of weight this result set like what you guys are used to seeing around the office on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can see that, yes, I also want to show, yes, in the choose statement, you can have duplicates like we're seeing here with multiple errands, and uh, it will increase the likelihood of those when you're using random numbers of that person or that item showing up in the result list there. All right, on to coalesce. I have a quick question. Yeah, um, question. Can you fill up choose with nulls, or will that give you an error like the case would? Oh, with all nulls? Yeah. Oh, let's try that. Choose three like that. Yeah. Good question. Hmm. Works fine. We get back null. Okay. So if we do two. Uh, three. Well, first let me try it with the three. If we run that with the three, we get a null because it says right. in the documentation if it's greater than the size of the options or less than one, you'll get null back. But what if we just do a two, like the yeah, I, I, or IIF function? Again, it works. We still oh, get null. <laughs> so we can assume at this case that if it is wrapping the case statement, it's doing it somehow a little bit differently than we saw before, or it's an all new uh, function. Can you have a query that produces a result set of you know, Steve and Pete Cody? So like choose and then select a column name from a table? Uh, yes, the way you could do that is you could say like select, oh, you mean to pass the so the question was, can we pass a column into this list here? Like, yeah, result set. Uh, sure. Result. Uh, no, I don't think you have to pass a. Yeah, you have to pass a fixed list of strings in at this point, or a, a fixed list of objects. It doesn't have to be strings. It could be numbers, uh -huh. or other things. But it, it has to be a fixed list, not like a subquery or a select list or okay. select at that point. All right, so on to coalesce. Coalesce, it's kind of similar to the case or choose in some cases, but what it does is it says, give me the first non-null item in the list. So it's kind of like is null with two parameters. Uh, where we're saying coalesce of parent, which is the name of a column in this example, comma zero. Uh, but it's, is null would return the same thing in this case. It would, if parent is null, it would set it to zero. Otherwise it would return parent. But Coalesce will accommodate more than two fields. You can say parent, if it's null, then look at this other field. Otherwise, if that's null, then let's return zero. So coalesce, uh, we're going to create a new table called departments, and we're going to put in there the same stuff that we looked at in previous training where it's like a department store or a camping store. And we're just going to take a look at what's in the table like, oops, like we normally, like we normally have done. And you can see here we get a list of the departments and the parent column in some cases is null, which signifies the top level. In other cases, it's set to one, meaning that all of these are under the camping department. And we can say in this case, give me the parent. Otherwise, if the parent is null, set it to zero. Kind of like the is null function would have set those to zero. But the difference here is you could do multiple columns in there as well. Uh, and here's an example, or actually not an example of multiple, but uh, let's take a look at how it compares to is null. So what I'm going to do is turn on the execution plan here. I'm going to call coalesce on selecting max parent from departments. So it's a subquery or drive table query inside of the select statement. So that's going to get one, run once for each time through the result set. And I'm going to turn on st statistics IO and I'm going to run it with coalesce. I'm going to run it with is null to see how it compares when we're doing just a two-parameter option, which could work with either is null or coalesce. 
We run that. We get the same results back on either of them. We look at the plan. The coalesce is a little bit more costly here in that it takes up 62% of the overall cost versus 38. But when we look at the output, one, one of them caused a 10, 10 scans and 30 logical reads, while the isnull did two scans and six logical reads. So to get the exact same result, if you're looking at using isnull versus coalesce, SQL Server's done some things to optimize how that isnull is working so, it's, so it doesn't do uh, as much work uh, as the coalesce does in that specific case. But if you need to use more than three parameters, coalesce is what you want to use. That wraps up the or that wraps up the logical functions. Now on to the next section. Uh, while we change seats here, just keep in mind follow Aaron and I on Twitter uh, for more information about the ongoing classes. All right, on to user defined functions. Uh, user defined functions are uh, scalar functions are are user defined, uh, table valued, both multi statement table valued and single statement. Tabled value functions are user defined, uh, and going to cover a section on how to incorporate those in views and how to get them to work in views. So, quick overview on scalar functions: uh, can have one or many inputs. You perform one or many uh, kind of condition statements or uh, code scripting manipulation inside of a function. If your function is just going to have one query in it, uh, then it's probably better to have that outside of the, not have that in the function. Uh, you'll see why later. Uh, and they return a single value. Uh, what you can't do in a function, you can't call non-deterministic functions. So get date is a considered non-deterministic because it returns a different value every time you run it. You can't perform insert updates or deletes on tables or views inside of a function, inside of a scalar function. Uh, you can't do any error handle, handling. You can't do print statements inside functions. And they uh, don't get included in a compiled execution plan, which is very important. And we'll, we'll see. So hop over to the scripts here. <coughs> So we'll drop and create our database again. Uh, we can do the inventory or kind of department store database layout. We've got a categories table and an inventory table. Yeah. All right, so uh, scalar functions. Um, in this sample here, we're going to put this query inside of a simple function. We It just does a... A select from the categories table for a category ID returning the title. So we can put that logic inside of a function. And this is the syntax here. We have a create function and then your parameters. And you define the data type of what it is returning. And then you say as and the begin and the end. And you have your logic in the middle. And you always have to have a return and what you're returning. The data types should match up with what you declared at the top here. So we, the very simple function, just a one statement function, passing category ID. We run that select statement from before on the category ID, returning the category name. So let's uh, create that here. And this is how you, how you call it. You have to uh, declare the, the schema on the front of all user-defined functions that it's in. Run it here. Oops. You can see that returns sleeping bag, which is the same as run, pulling that query out and running it. So to change a function and retain any permissions you have around a function, you have to alter it. So, and that's just the only difference between the create and the alter is, is that word right there, create or alter. 
So we can run it here and see that run it all you want. Just alters it, changes it. If you need to change the permissions around a scalar function, uh, you have to drop it. So if your standard practice is to drop and create functions or objects instead of just altering them, then you, you need to be aware that you're going to be losing uh, permissions and possibly other properties around those objects. So we'll recreate it. Just a question on that. So yep. in, in that case, if I had created a function previously and I had set up permissions that said only these users have access to that function and this other set of users don't, yep. and I dropped the function and recreated it, all those permissions are gone. But if I altered the function, they all stay there? This Correct. Permission the permissions the that way. you define around the, the function in this case will stay if you use an alter, but you will lose them if you say drop and recreate. Wow. So now, I mean, that's a simple function. We let's see, we recreated it. Uh, now let's compare the performance on them. Um, here. M, turn on the execution plan. Turn statistics IO and statistics, statistics time on. Uh, and we will first run a query where we're doing an inner join from the inventory to the categories table just to get that category title back. And then we will run a select statement where we don't inner join, but we are running this the name for category function for every row in the inventory table. So as you would expect, the result sets are the same. The execution plans are different. So I, I've heard a lot of people be like, well, this is how I tune stuff. They look at the execution plan. And in this case, you would think that, well, the second one was ran at 12%. And the, the first one with the inner join was at 88%. So this second query is faster. Uh, but if you look at it closer, you can see that that compute scalar, which is the user defined function, the scalar function, you can see that control one, that the estimated number of rows and executions, I'm sorry, let me clear this out. New tool here. The estimated number of executions and rows are both one. So it, when it goes to create the execution plan, it doesn't look into that function at all. It's just a black box and just gives it an, an estimated value and just, just runs with it. So the execution plan for this second query here with the scalar function is lying. So it's, it's totally worthless in a direct comparison with other execution plans. When we look at the statistics IO on it, time with these tiny queries, it's not really a good indicator of how long each one took. But on statistics IO, we can see that the first query, which was just inner joins, we can see it did a scan on both of the tables, so we know what it actually did. With the second one, it only reports that it looked at, or it only scanned the inventory table, so it completely hides the fact that it went and looked at the categories table, uh, I don't know, seven times or however many times it had to go and look up that category so, title. So by putting it in a function, you can magically pull data out of tables without ever scanning or reading from those tables. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And, I want, and I'm going to hop up to the the query where we just ran this here. So in this case, we are just running uh, the function. We're not hitting that inventory table anymore. So we are hitting the category table once. You'd think it would cause a scan on that table. Yep, shows up here, but estimated rows is a one, one again. And in the statistics IO, it shows that it just magically, magically came up with the data. It didn't even scan any tables or look at any tables. Just magic. 
That's true for all of them, no matter how hairy scary they are inside. Correct. So I isn't able to create their own actual time for their entire function. Because it doesn't know what's what's going to be passed in when it's going out and fetching all the, the structure and how to best look at the structure. I, so I, I think a, a, a more sorry a, a more correct answer sorry to jump in on that yeah. one, but a more correct answer to that one, Cody, would be when they built the query optimizer in SQL Server, they they didn't account for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that they could probably account for if they put enough focus and effort on it one day. Yeah. But uh, it's just it's it's just why? Because they didn't. Yeah. The uh, guy didn't exist when they first made it, right? Right. But somewhere along the line, they added them, and uh, yeah. So that's a this and well, yeah, scalar functions and multi-statement table value functions, as you'll see, uh, both are not included in the query plans. And I've seen that people uh, that. In compiled languages, yeah, functions are great. You know, you write the code once and call it multiple places, and that's that. It, you know, increases your performance, and you know, you're clean coding things, and it's easier to maintain. But in the scripted language in SQL Server, it's they're bad to use um, if you're going to have queries inside of them. Especially, yeah, especially so, if you're querying. So it's probably true for system functions as well, one or built-in ones that they provide. Uh, calculate date functions, or I don't know what other kinds. You know, they, they have. That depends. I mean, if you are doing date comparison functions uh, in the select portion, that's that's fine. In the columns you're returning. Do they account for the time though? Anywhere? There's still a function. It's still like get date. It's still a function. So. Yeah. It's so it's a zero, right? So it's being treated as zero in that case. Yeah. In the plan. But if, if you have it, if you have get date in the columns you're selecting, and you're selecting 10,000 rows, it's going to run that get date function 10,000 times. Yeah. So it'd be better to put that into a variable before your query and then run it. So you get one solid get date that functions only ran once. Um, if you're doing compa comparisons with those system functions or user defined functions on a column in a table, in the, the where clause, then that kind of it has to do a whole table scan to be able to pull that data out, run the function. The functions are evil. You just need to know how to use them properly so you are. Yeah. And the more I've learned about them, the less I like to use them. So we have a question that came in over here. Uh, that says, but how could the SQL team in the developers who built it uh, account for unknown values in the functions? And what they said is just add the option recompile by default. Uh, so, are we going to talk about option option recompile? Uh, as or in, dump the execution plan every time. That would slow. <laughs> that would add a lot of overhead to every time you ran the query because it would ignore any execution plan. Have to go out and fetch all the table information. Are they saying just to evaluate the performance though? Uh, no, well, no, because it, at, at runtime, one of the common things that a lot of people will do is they'll put the option recompile in on their function, which says every single time it's executed, forget any existing plans and recalculate it based off of the parameters that are being passed in right now. So effectively, at that point, you are flooding the plan cache with multiple plans, or maybe it's not, not really flooding, but it's just not using any value in the plan cache, uh, and it effectively ends up. Uh, slowing down the performance and all of those. However, it may, in a single performance case you're testing, you may get better results. Overall, it slows down uh, the entire runtime. Yeah, and it'll be caching every new fresh plan you create every time you run it, which would push other more val valuable plans out of the plan cache and slow everybody else's queries down as well. Good question. So, good question. Uh, now we're going to go on to table value functions. Uh, what do they do? You can pass in no in parameters, same with scalar function, or you can pass in many, and you will get a result set as the output. Uh, there's different syntax for single statement table value functions versus multi-statement table value functions, where you're going to do select, maybe manipulate some variables, and and you know do an update to a temp table or something like that. 
what you can't do is uh, you can't call non-deterministic functions inside of it. You can't do inserts, updates, or deletes to tables again, just like uh, scalar functions. You can't do error handling, can't do print statements. Um, and like I said previously, multi-statement table valued functions are not are black boxes. They're not included in the execution plan. So now we'll go to scripts for those. All right, so the syntax for creating these are diff is, is different. Uh, create function, you do your title and your parameters if you're going to have any, and it returns a table. This is the syntax for creating a, a single statement. And then you you have your query, so returns and then your query. So we'll run that. Create it. And we'll do a select star from that function. It just returns category title and category ID from the categories table. You can treat it as a as a uh, subquery or a derived table. You can oops, sorry. You can filter on it. So just treat it as a regular table. You can also join on it. You can see here that we get the you know, since, it, since it is a select star, we get the two columns from our single statement table value function and all of the columns from the inventory table. So now we'll look at the syntax for a multi-statement table value function. Uh, that's it's a little bit different. You say returns and then your variable name, a variable name, and returns table. You define the table structure that it's going to be returning. And, you, and then you have your, uh, your queries or your multiple statements inside of the begin and end. And at the end, you have a return. And then w inside that, you have your multiple statements. I have these commented out for use later, but we'll create this. And it's just going to return the exact same results as our single statement table value function, which is category ID and title from the categories table. So now let's compare the results. You can see that the results are the same. Oh, at the both queries that were ran is a select star from the from our uh, table functions here. So let's compare the statistics statistics IO uh, a little better. In the execution plan here, we can see that it's a 41 and a 59. The estimated uh, number of executions is one for the multi-statement. Let's uncomment all these inserts that I did. So I, now the multi-statement table value function will insert into the, the table it's returning, uh, the data that we want. It'll delete it. It'll insert it again and delete it over and over again multiple times. We'll change this to an alter. And then we'll, we will run our queries again. We can see that the uh, it thinks that it only hit the inventory table. Well, it, it did only run against the in, join against the inventory table once. Did a scan on it. Let's get this up here. But it did not include the many many times. See, it, it scanned the inventory table once, just like our single statement one did. And our single statement one table value function shows that it, it hit the categories table, but in our multi-statement table value function, it does not show that it hit the categories table at all. And the execution plans are the same. 
So we can see that when you use a multi-statement table value function, the uh, execution plan applies to you again. So Aaron, on the multi-statement, you select into that variable and that's what gets returned? Correct. Because I defined it when I created it, that this variable right here is what is going to be returned. And I believe you can have multiple returns in there, but that's very, it's not clean code to have multiple exit points in a function. So the question was, all you, what you do in a uh, multi-statement table value function is fill a variable and it will get returned. And yes, the value that gets returned is defined at the top or the variable that gets returned. And the single value still returns more than one row, correct? Correct. The it's just a single statement select or whatever, right? It gets returned? Yeah, yeah. So with the single statement table value function, it still returns a result set, but you, you're not defining a variable that you're filling, and you don't need to tell the, the, the function to return uh -huh. a variable out. So when the optimizer uh, runs this query here, which we're joining to, it kind of you know pretty much copies and pastes it in here as a derived query, mm -hmm. so it can actually see it and include it in the execution plan and optimize accordingly. And that's really the key right there. The way it does that substitution as a like derived table. Yeah. That's why you get the appropriate numbers in your plan rather than the other one where it's treated like a black box. It's a subtle difference, isn't it? But massive when you're looking at performance. Yeah. And when you're, yeah, when you're trying to tune something, you can know what's helping and what isn't helping. All right. Now on to views. Uh, in views, you can have deterministic functions, so like what we discussed last week, uh, getting portions of strings, uh, substrings, func system functions that return the same data every time that you call it. Uh, Non-deterministic functions such as get date uh, returns a different value every time you run it, no matter where you're calling it. You can't have those in a view unless you have schema binding on the view. Well, you can't use system non-deterministic functions in views. Uh, you, you can only call user-defined functions in views if you have schema binding on the view and on the function itself. And schema binding means that you can't, if you have it on a view, it means you can't drop any of the tables uh, in that view it kind of locks that view and all of its references in the system. Uh, so let's do some samples here. Uh, syntax for creating a view is just create view and your name. Uh, in this case, I have schema binding included on there. You don't need to have any parameters because when you're referencing a view, it's referenced as a table. So you'd say select star from my view, uh, like right here, uh, and you could have your where clause on there. So let's create the view and just kind of select star from that view. And this this view has a deterministic system function in there, uh, which is the left six of the title column. And we can see here in the first row sleeping bag was cut off. It's now just a sleeping. And we can create a unique clustered index on that view. So when I reference the view and say I'm filtering on that column, this, the system doesn't have to reach into the view and then into the, the lower tables. It stores this view as a uh, as a kind of, as a copy of the data. So adding non-deterministic views, 
uh, create the view with schema binding. And this is the a function that we had defined previously. So we'll create that. Oh. We get the error message. Cannot schema bind view with our view name because that function itself is not schema bound. So what we have to do is alter the function, uh, return the table with schema binding. And now we can create our view, schema bound of course, and we can select a star from that view. And now we get the category title, which was a table valued function, single statement table valued function, which returned the title uh, for passing an ID in. And see, we joined on the on that function there on ID. And that's it for uh, defined functions and how they're included in views. So, any questions? So, yeah. Do we have any questions on anything we've covered today? So, uh, if you have an uh, output variable on a procedure, mm -hmm. instead of rather than using a function, a, a scalar function, uh -huh. um, then does the execution plan is it accurate or that same issue? Uh, it would. When you're, let's see, exactly. depends on what's inside of the store procedure. I mean, if you're using queries, multi-statement queries, yeah, same it would, yeah, the same issue. So in two weeks, right. we'll be covering store procedures, and we'll talk about that some mm -hmm. then as well. Mm -hmm. But the issue of the black box is referred to with the uh, table value or with functions in general. Unless it's a single uh, statement table value function mm -hmm. that only that only exists for table value function or for, for functions, uh, sprocks are treated differently, and we'll we'll cover but that the, in yeah, two weeks. There are issues with sprocks around caching the parameters of when it was created, and yeah. they have a whole different set of problems. Yeah, <laughs> that if you don't know about, they'll be. So fake time, yeah. fake time two is is that in SQL Server two thousand eight? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. Gosh, I'm so ignorant. <laughs> so you can index any deterministic function that's user defined, whether it's table value, scalar, or view. Is that correct? Uh, no, that was placing an index on a uh, view. So you can't index deterministic table value functions or scalar functions? No. That's. The question was, oh, sorry. you can't index functions. You can only index views, I think is what we're trying to say. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, however, if the function is called from a view, you can then add the index on the view. Is that is yes. accurate, right? You, for, even if it's non-deterministic? For non-deterministic, if you want to include a function that is user-defined, like in, in this example right here, uh, this is a single statement table value function. If you want to include that in a view, you have to have schema binding on the view, which locks any tables, and you have to have schema binding on that function itself, which locks any tables in that function. And then yeah. you, you can add an index on the view if you, if you desire. Another question. Uh, if the view is same amount, can you update any of the uh, reference fields in any of the, in any of the tables that it's bound to? So the, the question was, if a view is schema bound, can you change any of the columns yeah. or change the schema underneath yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, I don't believe so. Yeah. You're, you're, you're locking in the uh, underneath layer. So. so let's jump back to the slides then. All right. And uh, slide over just a little. so tune in next week, uh, same time. 
uh, on Thursday, 9 a.m. And one of the things I realized as we went through this, we based everything we were doing off of the Joe's to Pro's books. And we skipped book one because there were a lot of basics in book one. But one of the things I realized that we overlooked on that was just some of the basics of joins. And hopefully everyone who's here or attending online can do basic inner join or left join based off of some of the stuff we've done uh, through the training so far. But next week, we're going to go back to basics to make sure we've covered everything you ever want to know about joins and more. We're going to cover inner joins, left outer joins, right outer joins, semi join, the anti semi semi join, the left outer with exclusion, right outer with exclusion, full outer joins, cross joins, full outer join with exclusion, lateral joins, cross and cross apply, as well as other combinations. So uh, this is going to be one of those that's going to start out with some real basics, like here's how you join two tables, and then we're going to build on top of that to show everything you could ever imagine about joining tables. Cool. And a lot of the comments that I've got from people on this in the past is, wow, everything I've done has always been an inner join or a left join. Now I can use all these other ones. Uh, and for those of you in the room, you can see the poster up on the wall here. Uh, we've got an expanded version of that we're going to be using. And for those of you online, you can visit stevestedman.com, and there's a link to the new poster. Uh, and basically, everything you ever wanted to know about joins. So please join. Uh, no pun intended. Please join us next time uh, for uh, Back to Basics on Joins. For more information, visit emergencyreporting.com. Find out more about the company uh, or visit Aaron on the web or myself on the web at these locations. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.